back to Growing With My Fellow Growers. This is Jack Greenstock filling in once again for Shane of the Cheap Home Grow podcast. I am thankful for everybody here tonight, both the listeners and my wonderful panel. I am waiting just a moment while my YouTube loads so I can mute it so we don't get any background feedback. And then I'm going to introduce my panelists, starting first with Spartan Grown. Go ahead, Spartan. What's up, everybody? Happy to see you. Happy to be here for uh, our church. <laughs> and uh, you can find me on Instagram at Spartan Grown. Or uh, you can find me on YouTube at uh, the Michigan Grows Grow Show, right here at the Cheap Home Grow Channel, or at the GML Show Channel, or just Grandmaster Level Channel, I think it's called. I think you are correct on that. I'm going to add Aaron the Grower now, but pass it over next to Matthew Gates. Yeah, hey everyone, this is Matthew Gates. I'm an integrated pest management specialist. For those who don't know, I run a YouTube channel, Science Communication, about uh, plant physiology and pests and those interactions. So if you're interested, check me out on Zenthanol. It's the same account that I'm going to be commenting with. And uh, I look forward to this uh, topic today about water and maybe a few other things. I'm thankful for you joining us as always. I'm going to pass it next to Dr. MJ. Hey guys. Yeah. Dr. MJ Coco from CocoForCannabis.com. Um, invite you over to our website, check out our articles, tutorials, and guides on the science and practice of growing cannabis. We are in the middle of our plant training grow challenge, which is going really well. So come and check out all those journals and, uh, yeah, I look forward to the show today. I'm excited for that. I've got my three plants that I'm doing low stress training that should be ready for October 1st flip date. So I'll be, uh, trying to get all signed up and, uh, all right. Yeah, for the plant yeah, training growth challenge. Next big giveaway is October 1st. We got the Photon Tech X45, X465 watt going up in just a couple of weeks, Jack. So you got to get registered. That's also going to be the last um, time to get registered for this challenge. So Good stuff. If I yeah, do win it, I'll give growing. it away. If I win it, I'll give it away because I don't have enough uh, grow space right now. And I've got lights that I'm plenty happy with. But uh, maybe I'll give it away on this show if I do win. But hopefully it goes to somebody else in the community. Yeah, it. no, it's a it's a sweet ass life for a four by four grow tent. So somebody's going to be pretty happy. I think uh, our next panelist may be in a four by four or five by five at home, but he's also a commercial grower. Brandon Rust. Uh, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because it's like a mechanic, right? That maintains really expensive cars and then they're like driving a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. That's, I guess I'm a, I have been neglecting my home grow for sure. Um, but, uh, things are coming along. I'm really just doing projects for uh selection and some little stuff at home but anyway you guys if you're not familiar who i am i'm brandon rust and you can find my instagram at rust brandon and i'm glad to be here i'd love to be here with all the panel members everybody's doing things a little bit differently and we can all vibe off each other's groove so for sure well we are always happy to have you and next up aaron the grower that's me, uh, ATG Acres uh, on Instagram, and um, also soon to be .com because I just bought that, and uh, so that's cool. Uh, got a couple things coming on that front, so that'll be fun to look out for. Uh, I'm talking with Eagle on Thursday, so I'm really, really excited about that. Um, finally joining the fucking talking shit with Eagle Club. So um, yeah. I don't know. I'm really excited about this uh, topic. I love this new, like, I know you guys used to topic stuff a long time ago, but I love how we're starting to topic stuff again. I definitely think it's good to at least have uh, some sort of topic that we can hit on each week so that we have something focused and uh, can sort of expand upon. And then as soon as we go through that pretty uh, extensively, we can always move on to random questions in the chat or anything that people have on their mind currently. So thank you again for joining us. Last but certainly not least, we have Noah the Groa. Hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm Noah the Grower, the two weeks from Instagram. I've uh, been a medical grower for over 10 years and uh, been in charge of a little bit bigger grows before, and I've been involved in cannabis since 1995, and I'm happy to be here, everyone. Always happy to have you, Noah, and everyone on the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Chat, everyone who's here live, thank you for joining us. Make sure you hit that live chat, speaking of which, so you can see all the messages and you don't get anything filtered out. Um, Again, thank you all for joining us. And if you're listening afterwards, thank you as well. 
I just wanted to bring up a little bit of why we're talking about water. Many people might think that's a pretty simple topic. I water my plants with water. You know, it doesn't need to get more complicated than that, right? But there's a lot of things that go into it. Depending on where you live, your municipality might have you with chlorine or chloramine in your water, or you might be on a well that has a high or low levels of sediment. Some people prefer to use reverse osmosis water. That's personally what I used for a while when I was running in cocoa, but I do think it is a bit unnecessary. And I think Doc maybe can go into that after. I'm currently growing in organic soil and uh, I've tried both reverse osmosis water and water from my tap. Um, just for a little reference, I'm in a city that does have chlorine. And I know a lot of people worry a lot about the chlorine. Um, I'll say two things on that, that fulvic or humic acid can deactivate chlorine and chloramine. And I've also seen um, a study that I wanted to bring up because I'm a little bit unsure about it. It was done in Canada. It's not a true scientific study. It was a YouTube experiment that I saw. An individual watered their plants with water straight from their tap with chlorine or chloramine, no bubbling it at all. Then they used reverse or a uh, water that removed that somehow. They had a filter to remove it. And um, they bubbled one to get the chlorine out for 24 hours. And they tested side by side and showed bacteria levels in the soil. And I know bacteria is not everything because there's fungi and bacteria. But interestingly enough, the water with the chlorine after the few weeks was done, the soil samples showed highest uh, bacteria levels in the chlorine sample. So I know a lot of people are worried about the chlorine killing off their microbial life or just uh, any life in the soil. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a interesting sort of point of reference and a little bit about the water sources that I'm using. And then uh, maybe I'll throw it first to Dr. MJ because I've heard you talk a little bit about reverse osmosis water and why you think it might um, and it, why you know, actually, because you've, in your own experience, found that it's not necessarily um, a requirement for growing in cocoa coir. Yeah, no, I don't think it's a requirement for growing in cocoa coir. I do think that um, it can help um, filtering the water in some way or another if you're starting with really bad water. But basically, the one of the main things I think you need to pay attention to when you're fertigating is the electrical conductivity of the water that you're starting with. Um, th that's basically a black box, so you can't count on that. So there's, there's already going to be some salts dissolved in the water, um, and they're not going to be doing anything really for your plant. Um, you know, even if there's a large calcium dose in the water that you get municipally, that's not going to be the best calcium source for your plant. Um, so you want to um, limit the sort of starting water electrical conductivity so you have more room to put nutrients in when you're fertigating. And that's a sort of a different conception. I think one of the things that you really need to pay attention to when you're thinking about watering is also how you're fertilizing, because there's a, a huge interaction between the water and the fertilizers. Um, and if you're fertigating, you're never going to be putting RO water onto the plants directly. It's always going to, you're going to mix salts in with it first. Um, if you have uh, amended soil, then you add RO water, that's going to dissolve more of the stuff that's sort of amended in the soil. So it's important to understand and to, to sort of match the way that you're, you're watering with um, the style that you're fertilizing. That's a great point about the RO stripping more from a soil than um, a typical water out of a tab. But I'm just curious. Yeah, particularly if you're getting any runoff. I mean, if you're not getting any runoff, then it's just going to sort of, you know, re-precipitate or, or stay within that media. Um, but if you're watering the runoff with RO, you're going to be leaching out whatever's sort of left in the media. And that's an important, I see people doing that um, with amended soils, watering the runoff with RO. And um, we, we water to run off with RO, but we're mixing in salts. We're mixing in all our fertilizers in, in that situation. And you're right. I don't think it's necessary unless your water is starting that's really poor. And even then you don't need reverse osmosis to sort of lower the, the electrical conductivity. And that's our main concern with uh, the starting water. Uh, Spartan Grown, I know you're taking a rip right now. So I'll give you a second as I lead you in on this next question. Um, Doc told us a little bit about his thoughts on the water. I'm curious because as we talked a bit before the show, you and uh, Brandon both, we'll go to him next, but um, grow both at home and as well at a larger commercial facility. So I was curious what water you choose to use in your home grow and if that differs from the commercial grow and if there's any specific reasoning behind the water sources you're using. 
Yes and yes. So I use two different things. In the commercial setting, I'm in cocoa. I'm feeding synthetic nutrients. So for, and I'm in a commercial setting and we want consistency. Consistency is king because everybody wants projections and, and, and numbers and, and be able to count on things. So it's, in my opinion, almost a necessity to get that water to zero that way or as close to zero as possible. That way, you know, every input that's in there and you can expect the same results every time without having variables. Um, water sources, especially water sources on wells that aren't municipal sources. But if you're pulling from a well, the, those, the levels, um, the EC level, I guess you want to call it, or basically what's in the water changes depending on how full that, that uh, aquifer is or that well is that you're pulling from, depending on the time of year, uh, depending on the minerals that are around that. So a lot of things can change. So it's, it's so much easier to eliminate those variables right from the get-go by using an RO system um, in that system. Now at home, I'm uh, organic and uh, I am not mixing any minerals back into the water. So to me, I'm not super concerned. I do get municipal water. I get a report every quarter or something like that. I don't care at all about chlorine. That's the least of my worries. Um, if you have like a five gallon bucket full of water, you can just put your arm in it and mix it one time. And the bacteria on your arm, on your skin is gonna neutralize all that chlorine. That chlorine is gonna get ate up by the bacteria on your arm. So uh, chloramine, I would be a little more worried about. I use carbon filtration, but I don't use RO. Um, the, well, the filter I use is called Berkey. It's B-E-R-K-E-Y, I believe. It doesn't require any power or anything like that. It's a gravity-fed system with carbon filters. I can put, I believe, six gallons in the top res, and then it'll filter through to the bottom. Um, there's like a spigot, and I just fill up water jugs with it. Does it produce a wastewater, or is it just removing stuff in the filter? No, it's just a carbon filter. So I have to like take those out. Type. Yeah, I have to take those out and like clean them off afterwards. Uh, you don't have to do that, but that just extends the life. I've been running the same ones for four years, not four years, two years. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of filtration system I'd recommend for that kind of a situation. I think uh, going to to RO, I mean, I agree with you, Spartan, with some of the benefits of RO. I don't think that the consistency suffers that much with sort of having a black box of maybe, you know, 50 ppm or like 100 micro siemens of, of electrical conductivity worth of sort of tap water stuff. Um, and one of the things that using a tap water actually makes a lot easier is adjusting the pH. Um, when you run RO water, there's not a lot in the water, even after we add all of our sort of fertilizers to um, buffer the pH and pH can swing pretty wildly. Um, so there are some advantages to having um, a little bit of tap water actually mixed in depending on sort of how you're setting up your fertigation system. I didn't hear that last, what was that last sentence you said? Um, just having some tap water mixed in, having something with more of a pH buffer so that the pH doesn't swing as much um, and sort of splitting that. So a lot of growers. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I would feel good about that if I knew what that was. Like, do I have CalMag in there or, you know, what, what am I adding in there? Because, I mean, we got so many tests that we have to pass and everything else. Right. I mean, it's super important to know what's there. I got you. And in a commercial setting, I think you're right in terms of managing some of those things. And you guys can stay right on top of pH and sort of micro adjust pH if you need to as, as necessary. It's just an area that I see home growers getting into trouble. They think that RO is better. Um, they sort of invest in RO or other really low EC water and they end up having pH issues because the, the RO water is just so much more sensitive to, to pH adjustment. Yeah, it's definitely interesting that there's really nothing in there. And uh, so there's not much for the water to like hold on to, so to speak, so that pH can swing drastically with even just like a little bit of a change of nutrients or pH up or down versus a tap. Yeah. Uh, so when I use source. tap water, I measure my up, <laughs> my pH up in terms of uh, milliliters. And when I use filtered or bottled or, or RO water, I measure it in terms of drops, right? So I'll do like a milliliter in, into a gallon of uh, tap water and like two drops into a gallon of RO water. 
Um, and that can, I mean, you add three drops and you've got 50% too much. It, it swings. Yeah, I've seen, out of bounds. You see that I mean, problem though, that problem at a commercial scale is not a big deal because uh, yeah, no, I agree. I hundreds agree. of gallons of water. So you're pouring a lot in anyway. I agree. That's just the downside of going to the RO system for a lot of growers. It does give you more room in your EC budget. It does sort of remove that black box that you don't know what you're feeding your plants. Um, you're not really feeding much of that to your plants, by the way. That's not going to be very many plant available nutrients in the tap water like that, especially in the presence of all of the plant available nutrients that we're making available to the plants. Well, in um, an organic situation, that's not the case. I have to wait my water. I have to wait for it to break down whatever's in it. <laughs> and my plants are going to break it down and, or not the plants, but the microbes are going to break it down and it could become available to the plant. The thing that you guys were talking about with the pH up and down with the drops um, in like RO or distilled water reminds me of a meme that i've seen where they're like putting like drops in and they're like trying to get it just to like 6.5 or something and they're like two drops of down and it's like 6.4 and it's like a few drops of up it's like nine and it is just like yeah well dangling. then you break through the buffer right and then it just starts swinging wildly i mean and you can't sort of control it anymore so that's that's kind of the issue but i totally agree with spartan in a commercial scale that's what you would do because you can stay right on top of those things um and i'm just advising home growers sometimes get themselves into trouble with ro water that being said uh i know uh, brandon was talking about or did he did we just lose him i think we did uh, i don't think we have brandon with us anymore so with that being said i'll give it over to noah the grower next to uh ask you because i know you're going to be uh out of here after probably the first hour or so so i want to yeah. get your opinion on what kind of water you like to use in your setup and why well you know i one of the things that uh drew me to this group um, i'm glad i came but uh was the cheap home grow aspect you know I'm, I'm kind of like that cheap home grow kind of guy and um you know i i apply money to where i think it's going to be most profitable and most uh you know proficient but I, I just leave my water sit out, you know, and I, I, I've gotten, I got, I'm on city water. I let the, you know, chloramine and chlorophyll and all that stuff, whatever's in there, just, uh, you know, evaporate out. And that's kind of what I was taught, you know, old school back in the day. And I, I have often wondered about maybe, you know, switched into some RO or, or doing a, a charcoal filter, but I always tell everybody, Hey man, you know, get your, make sure your humidity, your environment, your, your temperatures are where you want them to be. And, you know, for me, with you know running 5,000 watt lights um, and the, the possibility the capability of running eight you know I have a really nice exhaust fan I have a really nice um, air conditioner I have a couple different dehumidifiers so that's how I, I apply my you know my funds that way and good and really good nutrients so but hey I, I'm open to anything and I'm definitely paying very close attention to everything everybody's saying right now I had a question from the chat that I thought was actually a good one um, and then Matthew I saw that you also posed one after that that we'll get to it says, what about water from your dehumidifier? Can I use that? I would say it depends. Certain dehumidifiers, the water is clean, um, but I would you know, check and, and make sure. I think some people would have to clean their dehumidifiers before they go about doing that. But I know certain facilities um, out here in California and in Canada actually go 100% of their water usage is from reclaimed water, whether it's uh, dehumidifier water or some sort of uh, reclaiming, like they catch water from the, the roof and things like that for rainwater. But there are definitely um, indoor facilities that are capturing as much of that dehumidifier water as they can to use it for fertigation. So I know it's possible. Um, One of the guess... concerns there, yeah, I, I put this in chat, was the bacteria. Um, it's really hard to keep those things clean, as you mentioned, Jack. So the, the condensate water tends to have a heavy bacterial load. And even though it will be low in electrical conductivity, um, it can potentially cause problems for the plants. Maybe Matt could jump in on that. I was just about to say that. Matthew, um, uh, what would you suggest for something like that with uh, maybe trying to prevent pathogens and dehumidifier water? Well, you could UV it, but I would filter it. You filter it because you're going to pick up heavy metals on the fins uh, when it condenses back. That's how it, you know, it condenses on fins. I mean, let me say you're not going to. Let me say it's possible for you to pick up heavy metals and all kinds of, like you were bringing up d dirt, debris, uh, whatever you've sprayed near that dehumidifier, <laughs> uh, all kinds of things, at least filter it. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I've, um, I've interacted with uh, people who capture their water, just like you're describing Jack. And I don't actually know off the top of my head if they, if they uh, test the water in that way, 
but I think that they do. And a lot for a lot of the reasons that were kind of represented already, there's a potential for sort of leaching the metals um, through the water, through the condensation. Uh, there is awful, also definitely a, a possibility for microbial growth. Um, I was helping somebody out who uh, recently, who they were having trouble with some sort of like a, like a, like a, like a brown or red algae or, or something that had been growing in their reservoir. And it's because they can't, they just cannot cool their water. They do all this work to like recapture water and do other sorts of things. But um, uh, unfortunately the water temperature is a little bit higher than it should be to kind of suppress that growth. In addition to like using like um, oxidizers and that sort of a thing. So I think, but I think it's a smart idea to be sort of water conscious, especially as we <laughs> go further and further into the world, into, into time, you know, just being more conscious about how we use water. Um, I, again, I just think it's really important, but I think that there are ways that we could try to test that and sort of make it work, um, have sort of a, a practice for that. And it would just uh, require you to test like for various microbes and of course metals like uh, Spartan mentioned. Yeah, Smart Poker said that certain models, <clears throat> you need to watch out for lead. Um, so that would definitely be a uh, heavy metal that could cause failure, at least here in California and Michigan. I'm sure many other states that test for heavy metals are going to ding you for that one. So definitely making sure there's some sort of filtration happening. Um, what I was going to say at the very beginning is most of those systems that are set up like that are with that in mind. You know, they have the idea that they're going to be using that recaptured water. So they're probably like Spartan said, using a UV, I would imagine, to kill microbial oh, or other right. things and then filter it. I had an opinion about the UV. I forgot to mention that. Oh, good. Let's hear it. I think I mentioned this before, but since it's another video, um, for those who haven't heard it before, um, ultraviolet radiation, some people, I know some people who have applied it um, through their irrigation system at some point, like, but it's before, or no, it's after they apply certain uh, fertilizers and that kind of a thing. The problem they ran into was that the UV actually, um, it affected, it had a, phys, a, a chemical, well, not a chemical reaction, but it caused the, the compounds to change um, because of the UV exposure. And a lot of people might not consider that possibility, but it's kind of a unique effect of UV that it can break down certain compounds. And we've talked about that happening with other compounds like cannabinoids and that yeah. sort of thing. So no, that's cool. That's interesting. That I'd could love definitely to discuss um, give you a hard my, time. my water situation when you guys are ready. Um, yeah, I have sure. my most recent water test pulled up. Can we share screen or? I'll try and um, give you the ability because I think okay. you, I definitely can. I got to make sure. Or um, I could email it to you. If I'm going to make you the host, so don't do anything oh crazy. Oh, geez. Do you want to host Aaron the Grower? Yes. Oh, boy. The power okay. is yours, my friend. All right, let me share do my screen up. here. How do I do this? Oh, boy. So at the bottom center of the screen, there's a green button that says share screen. There you go. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Open that up. So um, I have domestic water and I also have well water, but the only thing that I have in my grow is uh, well water. So there's a tap and a reservoir and I got both of them tested because I was concerned that the pipes might be carrying some bad stuff, but it turns out they're, they're almost identical. But um, so let's take a look at the res. Um, you know, this is the kind of stuff you're gonna look at from Logan Labs. They give you electrical conductivity. They, they call it conductivity MMHOS per, I don't know if that's cubic meter probably. I, I don't know what that all stands for, but this is what you would see. Isn't that, and, uh, is that mercury it's supposed to be? No, I'm, I'm totally wrong. I'm, I'm looking I at think it's different. micro yeah. something. Per centimeter. Per centimeter. Yep. <laughs> Damn you, Brandon Rust. Where are you when we need you? Anyway, so. <laughs> uh, and then like alkalinity and carbonate, bicarbonate, all this stuff is important to test for. Chloride, sulfates, salt concentration, which is a concern. Um, that, you know, my level is particularly a concern. So I've always done, I always like to get a little bit of runoff and push a little so bit of water through. It's, it's, it's uh, millimoles per centimeter. 
apparently, according to Petro Wiki. Okay. I believe it. So it's it's a very it's a way to measure a very very small amount of electrical conductivity. Yeah, yeah, that that's millimeters, right? Or millisiemens? Is that what you said? Millimoles or something. Millimoles. Millimoles. Yeah. I believe that's the same. It's like I just found out that um, <clears throat> micron, like what they use for hash, is actually the same as micrometer. Exactly. Yeah, my, that's that's why I always say micron my uh, micrometer. Micronometer. Yeah, micrometer. Because what, are we that, talking zero point one seven is got to be? Um, well, I'll look into what those units are and what the conversion is. That, that's probably really, according to whatever I'm on healthalberta.canada milli equivalents per liter is what the MEQ slash L stands for. What, what's the what would it look like uh on your meter at home you know i don't know i've first i've seen a meq by l it's it's way like it's a very complicated definition when i was looking it up and i didn't really understand it but it says an equivalent is the amount of substance that reacts with an arbitrary amount of another substance in a given chemical reaction it's an archaic unit of measurement that was used in chemistry and biology <laughs> sciences <laughs> So there you go. There like, you go. Like all the people who spell sulfur with the pH, you know, live in life in the uh, 1630s. I really don't know the correct word. <laughs> some stuff's archaic then, really. and some stuff is, is cultural, I will say. I think like Europe uses some different spellings and, and words than we do. Um, they certainly do. I will say, Aaron, I, I wanted to get to the point of you've got this lovely water test, but you, you told us that you have two water sources. And you thought they were going to be different. They ended up not being different. You went with the well, oh. I believe you said. And um, how's it working out for you? Do you treat it any special way? Do you aerate it? Do you do anything fancy before you give it to the plant? Um, well, um, I slightly misunderstood me. I, I didn't test the, the domestic water because I don't have that at the grow. So all I, all I test is the, um, the, the reservoir that we store the well water in and the tap that immediately comes out of the ground. Um, so, so to test a few points along the line, and that's what these two represent. This one that I'm on here is the tap, and the one below, or I'm sorry, yeah, below, where the hell do they go? Yeah, is the reservoir. So they're almost like identical with like a few different differences, and that's... But one of those is a municipal supply, or those are all from a well? They're both from the well, but one is from the tap that's closest to the well pump, and one is I from see. the reservoir. Um, that that stores the water which is like a 2200 gallon reservoir and um so th the only reason i wanted to bring this up is because it's important to know what's in your water for me it was important to know the salt the calcium and even the magnesium levels which actually explain a lot of things going on in my soil which i i hope to cover soon on like on a post but yeah it's, a lot thing, it's, it's good to see that iron number being pretty low but i'd still watch it it's 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 a concern because my my well is highly like i don't know iron and they did there's um brandon rust is a fan of the we talked about last week the like veganic style of using no animal inputs because that reduces the salts in general so i know that helps within the media uh not with just the water source and i know that there's a song i believe that's um that's not true by one of the marley's and they say something like sativas don't need too much sodium, which I thought was kind of an interesting line because like most people don't think about sodium at all when they're talking about cannabis cultivation. And for them to be talking about that in like a reggae song, I thought it was pretty interesting because they do actually, one of them owns a cannabis farm out here in California. They bought a prison and they converted it to a cannabis farm. I don't know if it's still up and operational, but you can see it in the music video of medication. So check that out. That's a real cannabis farm. So they're definitely real cultivators in the Marley family. Pretty, pretty interesting history. Well, we went through the panel and everybody sort of went through their different water usage. So I was curious if uh, anybody has in the chat has questions about water um, sources and anything related to this and anyone on the panel, if you have final thoughts on this before we move on to a different subject. Oh, actually, Matthew, I wanted yeah. to throw it to you because um, like for IPM, for like foliar sprays and things like that. Um, are there certain things I've heard that like the pH of a certain water can matter um, 
like I, I was told, I think for plant therapy, if you want to use it for pests to foliar at a certain pH, but if you want to use it for molds to foliar at a higher pH. Yeah, that's absolutely a thing. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, pesticides. Uh, some of them are biopesticides. And so they require really stringent, like specific measures for that because if it's if, it, if you try to tink mix it with something or you know any number of things that you can do in such cases you can really basically make it inert and not work anymore um, but there's also like various chemical reactions you just don't want to have or that things sort of work or are more stable at certain pHs and that kind of a thing so as a broad topic it's kind of hard to talk about it too much but it totally makes sense I did have a question. I, I did bring up a question about whether people had heard about these nano bubbles, though. That's something that's unfamiliar to me. I've maybe seen it advertised at like a trade show, um, but I never like see, saw it catch on in any part of the industry that I'm familiar with. So I'm curious if anyone else on the panel has experience with that. I've seen videos. I haven't tried it, but um... If maybe I understand it incorrectly, but isn't it basically a way to get higher oxygen concentration into your water, or am I wrong? It's sort of, I, you know, I don't understand it totally myself. Um, I first heard about it back in 2014, um, and I was reading about how uh, Japanese agriculturalists were using it in their tomato hydroponics, I think, if I remember correctly. And I guess the benefit is that these sort of these bubbles are kind of like stable. They don't like float up to the surface and like immediately um, break apart or anything like that. And I don't understand. I don't personally understand how this is achieved. I don't. I've watched videos where they've explained it as being like high pressure um, and or heat, <laughs> but I don't really understand this. It's but regard the air that's in the bubbles or it, because you can make like micro bubbles with nitrogen, but I failed to see sort of the benefit to that. So these are micro bubbles with oxygen, right? I believe so. And it's the presence of the oxygen that creates the benefit of using them. Isn't there a certain amount of nitrogen in oxygen? I think there's also oxygen? a structural. So that's a good question because I think it's kind of both depending on the application because I, I guess, and again, I don't really know or understand, but I suppose that them being oxygen is important for like a reactive sort of thing. Uh, I've seen a lot of research about it using for a bio foul, uh, uh, yeah, fouling, sort of like an anti-fouling uh, water or to, or to sort of disinfect things. So I think it's on that, it's on that track, but I guess the, the physical sort of ultra fine nature of them also has like a kind of non-chemical physical chemistry effect, I guess, if that makes like, sense. Like surface tension. Exactly. What about like if they used atmospheric like oxygen? I know rainwater, for example, I've heard, I haven't really looked too deeply into this, but collects nitrogen as it falls. And so if it's collected, there's going to be at least some small amounts of nitrogen. I don't know if it's available to the plant immediately, but I feel like after it rains, everything greens up. And it's not just because the water availability, I think there's more to it. Yeah, there could be, yeah, it seems like they're, for whatever reason, they're sort of stable for longer than a normal bubble of, of oxygen, right? Um, but think yeah. About, like everybody knows like moving water, right? Moving, that's that's yeah. more safe to drink because it's moving, it's falling through a gas with with air in it. Same thing with rain. It's falling through air. So it's going to be super aerated. Aerated? Aerated? I think yeah. you're right either way. It's a potato potato kind of thing. But uh, I wanted to go with, um, I saw a thing that Harley, I think it was Harley. No, it, w it was uh, Bruce Bugby actually. It was like how to optimize cannabis yields. And he goes through and he like explains how to calculate DLI and he does a whole bunch of other stuff in the video. But part of it, he's talking about CO2 and he like uses these beads in a beaker. And he says, there's this X amount of beads you know, in our atmosphere of oxygen and like there's this much nitrogen, there's this much CO2 and CO2 is actually one of the least of that composition because like the air that we breathe isn't just pure oxygen. There's a bunch of other stuff in there like CO2. Yeah, no, it's actually almost entirely nitrogen. Isn't it like 70 or 80% nitrogen? Something like, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it's major, mostly major nitrogen. 
Um, that's why I was curious about the composition of the bubbles. That's what I was saying. Is it just air, like normal sort of atmospheric air, or is it just oxygen, um, or is it primarily nitrogen? They can make different size stable bubbles depending on the gas that's in the bubble. And both are achievable because like an air pump, like any of us have for an air stone is going to pull atmospheric. But if you buy an oxygen tank, like you'd have for your grandma to get herself some oxygen because she's not able to breathe as easily, then that's going to pump pure oxygen. And I think those would both have different effects and maybe different benefits. Yeah. yeah. And then there's always the electrolysis route, which is totally possible unless you have a lot of calcium in your water. Um, it's actually one of the, the routes that I'm most fascinated about in terms of oxygenating water because you can get it uh, at sort of a higher supersaturation of dissolved oxygen doing electrolysis than anything else. I'm also really excited about that kind of technology and, and using it in that sort of intelligent, clever way. I'm a big fan of that kind of stuff. Well, anyways, it's a topic that I actually don't know a ton about, but I remember reading a newspaper clipping <laughs> about this technology. And I haven't really investigated a whole lot, but I was just curious if people, it was an interesting topic nonetheless, right? So. I know that electrolysis can also be used. Um, I believe that at my grocery store locally, they have an electrolysis device that just basically pumps the pH way up for people that want like, a, it's like a health food thing. If you want high pH water, alkaline water, like nine to 10 pH, um, they can, just basically filter and crank that pH up. It's they have like three different taps, and one of them you press the button and it turns it to like 10 pH. And I believe that it's done through electrolysis. And I believe so, um, the guy guru said that they use it at even higher pH for like cleaning in certain kitchens now instead of bleach because at super super high pH it can kill a lot of molds and fungi. Yeah, and that's a huge area that you would want to be concerned with with all of these things is the potential impact on pH and pH stability. Spartan, I so, wanted to. Uh, throw it to you about the thing you guys have about the ozone in the water. Uh, I know that's a pretty uncommon use, but I think it's really a clever and uh, inventive way to use ozone in your water to um, basically clean up your grow. Okay, uh, but first, um, the machine you're talking about, and I don't know if it's electrolysis or not, but I think it was called, the term they called it was, uh, I can't remember, it's forgetting me now, I don't know, it's like electric, electric, electric something water, but anyhow, the pH scale, it goes it goes from zero to 14, right? The pH scale. So um, with those machines, you can use this in, in plant, for plants too, if you want to. Um, you can set the pH uh, high to give you a high output. So say for example, you did a uh, pH 10 because you want to use it as a fungicide. It's going to destroy most fungi, uh, a pH 10 water, and it's going to be fine on the plants. Well, what's left from your 14 points is four. So you're going to get pH 10 water, and you're going to get pH four water. Uh, that four water is very acidic. Uh, you could use that to maybe clean. I don't know if I don't know uh, if you want to spray spray plants with pH four water. I, that would be scary to me. Um, but maybe it would be a good pesticide. Uh, I'm not sure. I would ask somebody smarter than me. Uh, as far as the stuff we use at work, the, the machine we use is called the Triax Trioxy Complete, and um, it's basically a little square device, maybe this big gray it has fold out legs you plug one plug into the wall outlet um, it has one dial on the front to control like the it has a dial and the indicator bar for the amount of oxygen or ozone that's being injected into the water there's a double venturi uh, spinner inside the device and that's how the ozone is mixed into the water and um, you hook a water hose from your sink to this device and then another uh, hose from the device to wherever you're going with it. We just fill up buckets and we use it to clean our, uh, clean our tables after we harvest. We clean, every, well, clean everything with it. Um, and it just works by oxi or oxidation. So you got ozone is O3. And um, so you got everything in nature kind of likes to hang out together in pairs. So you got that oddball third one, it, it breaks off and it oxidizes the shit out of things. It just automatically wants to stick to something else. Um, so, um, but for, as far as humans go, you know what I mean? It's oxygen. It's, it's, very, it's very safe for us to use. We don't have to worry about uh, weird things coming up uh, against, you know, on ban lists and things like that. It's really safe for us to use. We've also been testing it as a IPM spray in veg. Um, 
the thing I am not a fan of with that is just the science behind it. Thinking about it is that's going to annihilate all of your microbiome on your leaf, on your, what is it called? You guys said it before. It's not a rhizosphere. Phytosphere. 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 There you go. I always, I always say, is it phyllo or phyto? Phylo. It's the phyloplane and the phytosphere. So Wait, did you say five, five those? Phylo. 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 Oh, okay. So I just been saying it wrong. All right. Got it. <laughs> And yeah. the reason I don't like that is, yes, it'll destroy the bad ones, but yes, it'll destroy the good ones. And now you have a clean slate just asking for anything to come. Not a big deal if you keep your place clean, but it always scares me a little bit every time I spray that stuff. But I can do it lights on. It doesn't even hurt it with the lights on. So Reinoculate with some goodies like a foliar of, I don't know if people do this, but you could maybe foliar the uh, recharge because they have a bunch of good stuff in there. I don't know if people yeah, are. Yeah, but when you're talking that. about commercial setting, when you're telling me, Hey, we just solved your problems. You don't have to spray weird stuff on your plants. You can spray ozonated water, but then, but then you have to go back and spray something weird back on after it. It's like, ugh, now I got to do twice as much work. Yeah, probably not going to do that. I wanted to give Kyle Breeder a second to uh, give himself the introduction. He got here a little bit late, but better late than never. Kyle, go ahead, introduce yourself. Sorry, boys, I was a little tied up. Um, yeah. Kyle Breeder, uh, if anybody's looking for feminized seeds, uh, please feel free to go to the letter P, breeding.com. And uh, my, all my social media sites are predicated breeding. And uh, I'm excited to see, uh, yeah, I'm a little late, but I'm excited to hear what we guys have to talk about tonight. So we talked a little bit about water. Everybody kind of went around the panel and talked about the water sources that they're using. And I'll give it back to you after that. And I'm thinking maybe a easy transition after this would be maybe like air quality and like what we might do for filtering. Do people do intake filters, uh, carbon filters, exhaust, things like that. Um, I've also seen like Urban Reber, Urban Remo has something called the Air Sniper, which has a UV filter for his air. But Kyle, um, as far as water is concerned, what is your water source for your plants? And uh, do you do anything special? Well, I would like to say that I have some type of uh, RO filter set up uh, where I live now, but uh, when I moved, I just been kind of using the, the tap, but for me, it's mandatory to sit out for 24 hours. So so basically after I water the plants, I'll, I'll immediately fill up and then basically 24 hours later, I'll, I'll go back into something else will need water at that point. Um, but preferably when I use like clones or anything like that, I specifically use pollen spring water why I, uh, I just have a very good success with it. I've tried pure uh, vapor distilled, which has zero PPMs, but uh, man, that stuff is real finicky when you're trying to add pH to it and stuff, but it is a good, uh, but it's also stripped of many things. Um, so I don't know if I would suggest doing that, but uh, it does work as well. Full and Springs is, is where I kind of head to when I'm doing like isolated water projects. It's funny because uh, you touched on like three or four of the things that we talked about earlier in the show, but I'm, I'm glad that you uh, have similar thoughts on some of the comments that we made earlier about pH and, and swings and things like that with the uh, zero ppm water. And um, we actually mentioned something that might make you feel better is Dr. Coco was saying how he and, and many people feel that you can be successful and, and just fine without using RO water. And it's not absolutely mandatory, especially for the home grower. Um, you can get by with using your tap if it's reasonable. I agree. Noah the grower, you got a hand up over there. I know you uh, got to be going here pretty soon. I want yeah, to. Yeah, no, I, I had a question. Uh, sorry to cut you off. There. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering uh, what the panel thinks would be a good option for uh, cheaply, a cheap home grow approach from filtering water. Um, just because I've had questions about it myself and, and have been curious about maybe kind of upgrading my water situation. Eagle Gardens has a good one I like. He uses those RV filters, which filter out like sediment and uh, chlorine, and they act really quickly. He has it right on a hose, and he can fill up buckets and buckets. It doesn't have a ton of waste. They're pretty quick. I know that there's also like the Boogie Brew uh, has those filters, a bunch of different uh, things that can just twist onto a hose and have a fairly decent effect. But I'm open to hearing thoughts from anyone else in the panel. Well, I would like everything. Maybe you could... Uh like everything Maybe you I could use. give me a link to those things, Jack, in our, in our uh, Instagram chat there. And then I'm curious to see what uh, everybody else. I kind of just do like the invest in upfront so I don't have to pay ever again on it. And that's what I did with my filter. It's just that Berkey water filter. You can get them on Amazon. You can get them everywhere. But uh, you can get different sizes. I got the biggest one I could find. And uh, I haven't had to, I mean, I've, I filled it up with filters, which was expensive. The filters are expensive but I just reuse the filters. I just clean them. 
and then just reuse them. So I don't have to pay for anything else after the initial investment. And I might've paid maybe a couple hundred bucks total with all the filters. Eh, it might be $300 with all the filters and the uh, unit, but uh, you can, you can get away. I started out with just two filters. That's what I could afford. And then every year with my tax returns, I got two more filters. And so now I think I have six. Spartan, have you heard of live live or live pristine filters? A uh, buddy of mine uh, said it, forget it organic uh, on Instagram, sent me this actually like yesterday. It's kind of relevant. I'm glad he did. Uh, where he said, uh, it's sort of like RO, but basically, let's see. Uh, hydro water filter, it's the only filter that gets rid of it also restructures your water and adds electrolyte salts back in that use used to be in our water before all the pollution. Magnesium bicarbonate, calcium bicarbonate, potassium bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate, and silica. Some of the best water you can drink and feed to your plants. pH is also on point. And he sent me the link. I've just, I think it's like livepristine.com if anybody wants to check it out. This scares me with all of the, I was on board until you started adding stuff back into my water no no i'm that, that's not <laughs> that's what you get you when you're when if you're putting tap water back into your ro it's essentially what you're doing this thing i think just takes it this takes it takes that step out where you know you don't have to worry about your ro being aggressive in terms of like stripping stripping uh yeah but know, it's talking about structured or, water and that's still one of those things that is kind of uh far out there in left field I mean, that's what, like what you know, mean? water. It said it structures your water. You said uh, one of the only filters that will structure your water. water. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Hydrologic, small yeah, nobody, boy. Shout nobody out to Sardis, Sorry. <laughs> there's, there's a thing about where like they freeze it or something and they can show you it's actual different structure from water that's moving as compared to water that um, isn't. So mm -hmm. like water, like they'll put rocks in a tube and, and run water through it and say, now that's better. It's structured rather than just running freely through a tube. Does it add to like the the paramagnetivity or Dude, something? I'm not Is that, there something I'm not that, I didn't I didn't buy into the 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 magic of it. It got it got okay. way way into the oh it's just magic happens and then it's this and then that's where yeah I just, we call that it, lose we, interest. we call that in science called PFM. It's pure fucking magic. Yeah, what manner of witchcraft is this? Yeah. There's a non-witchcraft filter that's affordable, the Hydrologic Small Boy. Shout out to Sour Diesel Tangy in the chat who recommended that. I've also heard the Dude Grows, uh, Scotty Reel, recommends the Small Boy filter quite often. So if there's some growers that are using them with uh, success, I think that it's great to put out the names of those brands to uh, make it known to the cheap home grow community because you don't have to spend big bucks to get an effective filter. Some of them are definitely cost effective and also effective for your garden. And I've actually seen a lot of people have a ton of success going straight from their tap without aerating it, without bubbling it, but that's in a, a soil setup. And like I mentioned earlier, if you do have chloramine, um, one of the big simple ones is humic or fulvic acid will neutralize it. And if you're in soil, that's like, even if you're in a cocoa, humic and fulvic acid are extremely beneficial. So definitely want to look into those things. But moving into the uh, almost second hour here, we're about 50 minutes into the show. I was curious, I know Kyle, you uh, have talked a little bit about having issues with carbon filters in the past when you didn't uh, swap them out and maybe potentially getting like PM and issues from that. Um, I don't know if you have a love-hate relationship with carbon filters, if you still use them and just swap out the things, but do you do uh, any other filtering? Do you filter the intake? I know being a breeder, there's gotta be probably some extra steps you have to go through that most people might not have to. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> to comment on, on what you said, so I had one that was running for a while and I never really touched it, but it was like still kind of working. And then, <clears throat> but I had the strap hooked up to one of the hot, I mean, it's wicked retarded, but I had it to like a hot water pipe. Well, eventually that like slowly seared the thing that was holding it and it just fell and exploded. I can only imagine like beyond billions of particles around the whole basement. Um, but yeah, and I think that's how I got PM. So I suggest changing those out. But now, uh, so each of my breeding tents, basically I have, um passive air so i have something exhausting out and i just have the lower port uh, of the tent wide open so it's pulling you know whatever cold air from outside into that tent and it just forces everything up and out and then on the edge uh, leaving that tent uh, i have a carbon filter for every single tent that i have um and i mean it's pretty damn accurate i know people say you can't breed multiple tents and not be like can i 
honestly say that like one, uh, some, a couple grains, maybe went somewhere, but not really, but I mean, it's pretty damn a accurate the way I do, as long as you do it one at a time and spray stuff down with water and stuff like that. And then what I did buy recently, which I'm absolutely in love with is that uh, I have a video of it. Um, it's basically, and I've been wanting to invent it. They just haven't had it, but I finally started at the grocery store is uh, basically like a portable filter. So you just basically duck from your window to this filter and then there's a there's a screen that pulls up and out and then you can replace that and then basically you add another hose to that to your intake um you know if, wherever that may be and basically so i have like fresh uh, outside air coming into my tents and uh, the plants are like radically loving it versus me just kind of rotating through the stagnant air in the, in the room you know um which a lot of people do and it's fine, but it's just, uh, I just noticed a dramatic improvement with that. So I would suggest what is, looking into it. What's the name of that little portable filter you use? Cause I, this air quality by me is terrible with the fires. Look up HEPA box that. filter, HEPA intake yeah. box. Or go down and buy a box fan and buy a fucking furnace filter and tape it to it. Well, dude, I, I mean, I was thinking about throwing up an old charcoal filter that, but it sounds like a jet engine with a 450 CFM like plugged into it, just running in the room. I would do it. That would do something at least. It'd be better than nothing. But I can't, you know, I'm talking about from my like newborns. Oh, I've seen them boxes he's talking. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like oh. a box that you can slide a HEPA filter into that basically uh, filters the air coming from his outdoor going to his indoor. And actually, I was going to say, uh, Fishionado actually uses those for all of his breeding tents. So instead of having those things open that you're talking about, Kyle, at the bottom of the tent, he tapes all of them over. And then he has one of those filters on every intake. So that way he can know there's literally no pollen coming in or going out of that tent unless it's being zipped open and he's doing collection right at that moment. So um, there's definitely good practices like that to avoid whether it's pollen or, you know, insects, um, PM, yeah. things like that. I wanted to bring that up. I mean, the HEPA filters are going to be a, a huge expense for most growers. And I don't think they're necessary unless you're trying to control pollen and, um, you know, you're engaged in a breeding project or something and there is pollen around. I think that w if you're dealing with sort of particulate matter or pests or other things like that, any kind of um, intake filter should be able to sort of remove most of that. I mean, I just use a, a silly fabric pot over my intake duct um, that prevents any sort of pests from coming in or, or most of the dust. It gets really filthy. I have to change them actually quite a bit. Um, but yeah, if you're doing a breeding project, I think HEPA filtration is important. I, I just didn't want it, like home growers to get the impression that, that we thought HEPA filtration was important just to keep the air and the grow space clean. No, I agree with that. But um, for breeding purposes, it's definitely worth uh, 50 bucks or whatever, I think, per tent to avoid cross-contamination. but Well, like that's saying, per filter. I mean, if you run a HEPA filter system, you have to change the filters quite regularly, and it's the filters themselves that are expensive. So, um, yeah. Can filter intake filter. Removes 95% of bugs mold. I remember, I, think, I feel like you posted about this, Kyle. Did you post about this a while ago? I feel like I saw this already. Yeah, I've been, I've been wanting to pull from outside air. I was like, why can't someone just invent like a, a mini basically a mini filter you know, I started at the grocery store and I just jumped right on it. Um, they have different Perfect. sizes, four, six, eight inch, uh, whatever you have going on, but can filters. But you can literally just fab up your own. I mean, yeah, those all you got to do is make, just a, make. And yeah, I, just I make suggest the black fabric pot. It's a good material. It allows a lot of air to pass through it. Um, it doesn't, it blocks almost all of the light. So you can use that during the flowering period. At least I do. Aaron, to your point earlier about fires, MERV filters, M-E-R-V, MERV, I think 16 is the highest rating. They're not very expensive and they're meant for filtering smoke in particular out of air. Um, firefighters actually use them when they don't have the full face mask going over for if it's not that extreme of a scenario. Like I got a bandana that um, helps filter out smoke and it uses a MERV 13 style um, filtration. So those do, if you want to filter the intake to your house. I know that like AQI, I don't know if we talked about this last week, but there's air quality index. And um, if it's over 100, anybody who's got sensitivity starts to have issues. And it's been that here in California many days because of all the fires. So shout out to the California firefighters and firefighters all over the country um, battling because that's a tough job. And like Brandon rightfully pointed out, some of those guys are um, inmates in the many California of prison those system. Guys are inmates. Many, yeah. Many of them. But, um, one of the things I wanted to bring up real quick, and it's kind of going back on the water thing, but I just remembered a cool trick 
to do if you have an RO system already and you're having to replace the RO filters a lot because your water's terrible, you can install another like sediment filter pre RO. That way you can really extend the life of your RO filter by, you know, that first sediment filter is really taking the brunt of the damage. <laughs> and those are a hell of a lot cheaper to replace than an RO filter. So uh, do a double sediment or something like that. Or, you know, you can be as creative as you want to be. Uh, it increases the speed. Makes sense for you. Speed too. So when it takes out all that junk with the first filter, it's a lot quicker to do the processing of the RO. So it'll both increase the speed that you're getting your RO and extend the life of the uh, the filter and like you said there's much 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 cheaper options that can uh, take most of the junk out we got through uh, kyle as far as air filtering goes spartan i know at the commercial end you guys probably are going through some sort of ipm uh, routine with your air do you guys have fresh air intake from outside or how are you guys going about uh, maintaining or managing your air we have sealed rooms sealed rooms and um we have supplemental CO2, and which is automatically filled. It's We don't even mess with it. It's just automatically, once the level's low enough, they get a wireless signal and they come and they fill it back up. So we're never, never out of CO2. Inside of our grow rooms are all our HVAC and all of our um, dehumidifiers. They're hung really high above everything. Um, the, the reason I bring that up is all of those have filters on them and those are all changed every cycle. After, after harvest, the next day we go up and we change every filter. So the air is constantly being cycled through the HVAC and being filtered that way with the filtration that's on those. Thank you very much. That's uh, something I think most facilities are not gonna take the time to do, but when you have such strict testing for microbial counts like you do in Michigan, when you guys were medical, I think you're transitioning towards the rec side, which allows you a little bit higher we're, counts, but. We're both, we do, we're, we're, we're running flower for both. So we just keep everything at medical level and it's easy. That's the smart way to do it. I mean, if you can uh, pass the most stringent testing, that's always a good place to be because especially right now in uh, both California and the Michigan markets, I know there's probably other markets that are similar to this. Um, if the testing is hard and there's only so much flour on the market, being able to pass testing immediately gives your stuff value. And uh, if you grow good stuff that pass testing, it's like puts you in a whole nother, you know, echelon of quality. So shout out to you guys doing things right. It sounds like you have great SOPs in line over there. And I think a lot of people can learn from doing things clean. And um, I hope that more people, I've actually personally seen it happening here in California at the very beginning of legalization. So few people were able to put any flour on the market, let alone high quality flour. And over the last few years, there's finally... I'd say it used to be like five out of a hundred were somewhat quality. And now I'd say maybe like 10 to 15 out of a hundred are quality. And I know it doesn't seem like a huge difference, but it's like double the amount are getting to that point that um, as a home grower, like, Oh, you know what? This is actually satisfying. It's overpriced, but it's satisfying quality. So if somebody, that's all they have access to, at least they can get something um, that's pretty good. I wanted to go over to Matthew. Um, and ask you, I know there's a lot of different um, re avenues to go about. So I would say if somebody was setting up like a greenhouse and um, they were trying to do like a hybrid style or something like that, what would you be your um, tips for somebody doing something like that? Um, actually, you know what, this is cheap home grow. Let's, let's do the home grow. What do you think um, an appropriate level of air filtration would be for the home grow level? From like a pest mitigation standpoint? Yeah, I mean, either pests, both like Kyle had a situation where he's trying to bring in fresh air and he got that can filter um, for pests, but also is there any um, risk of mold? And like, would you ever suggest something like, uh, I know at the higher levels, like I said, Urban Remo has something called an air sniper where his air filter um, basically has a UV in it and then it runs through that and it cycles that out to the rest of the grow area. So. I know that probably seems like a little bit overkill for home grow, but I'm curious your thoughts. No, I definitely, I've said it before in other, other sessions, and I'll say it here too. I'm a huge fan of the sort of neat technological um, uh, exploitations, I guess you could say, ultraviolet light being one of them, um, just harnessing the fact that UV can be very helpful for as a disinfectant. Um, and it's a non-chemical way to disinfect things. So that's a, there's a lot of value inherently in that, especially people who might be sensitive to such things or just want to avoid them in general. Of course, there are disadvantages, right? 
yeah, they both require coverage, but having a UV light um, affecting a filter, I think there's a lot of benefits there because that's the place where things will get caught up, of course. And um, even like th now most people think of like spores or various microbes, bacteria, fungi, that kind of thing. But um, a lot of microarthropods can be very susceptible to UV radiation. And I've mentioned already that this is why like spider mites and thrips and aphids and a lot of other insects like to stay um, underneath the leaves. It's not the only reason. There's also a lot of um, sort of predator mitigation and that kind of a thing just to not be visible. But the UV radiation does take a toll and it's, it's, it's toxic. It's toxic to us too <laughs> and too much, right? That's important to mention. I wanted to shout out Cheap Home Grow. Shane is in the chat. That's not me typing from his account. That is actually Shane uh, saying what's up to everybody. So cool to see you. Shane, we were actually talking about you in the pre-show. So happy that you joined us this evening. I wanted to go back to a point I made earlier about expense because this is the Cheap Home Grow and I mentioned that the MERV filters or the um, HEPA filters, the thing that I was talking about was actually a six pack of filters for 50 bucks and they're 20 by 20 by one. And the one inch is just like the width of the filter. So I think that makes it a little bit more affordable. If, um, like I said, for the hobby breeder, somebody who's got a few tents who wants to do more than one breeding project, getting those types of filters is a benefit. But if you're just doing, trying to avoid pests, I think a fabric pot or a simple MERV filter would be more than enough to be effective. I also want to say that it's a different kind of air filtration. It's a much more coarser air filtration, but insect screens um, are also really great. Whether you're outdoors and even indoors, honestly, if you want to like put some extra insect screen, like in a place or just around the plant or something like this, um, especially if you're, if you're in a closed off area that can seem like overkill, but um, I just feel like if you really wanted to be secure, you could definitely make it work. And I've seen it work firsthand. At, uh, as soon as Sequence this year told me he found his first uh, caterpillar, I said, do you have, I said, how are they getting in there? What, what hole is in your greenhouse? And we figured it out that it was the, his intake. I put some screen on, some insect screen on there. And that he did, they fabric, they couldn't, it was a weird, the way that it was set up, they had to fabricate their own like way to cover it, but they got it done and uh, they didn't have any other problems after that with the caterpillars. So sometimes the simplest solution is the best solution, just a physical barrier. I completely agree. It's the, it's the best advantage that we have against like moths for the, they're like big and you, bigger ones at least are kind of cumbersome and they can't get through a small little screen and um, that's it. <laughs> it's a great way to exclude them. And on along the same lines, one of the things that I noticed, I would say that's a common thing that people are, I think, missing is you, you can use your fans in your grow room to be a barrier for pests too. Any, anyways, flying pests. So think of the areas where your plants aren't uh, between your plants and your lights or below where you prune to the soil level. Sometimes I'll see it in one place or the other. I like both. I like airflow above the plant and below the plant. And that way, if you get, say, a fungus gnat, you know, it's going to hit that band of, of, you know, when the oscillating fan hits that way and it's going to blow him, who knows where. It may, hopefully it'll break his wing or something. I don't know. But uh, that's my thought on it. And I think it really helps with uh, keeping insects down and it helps the moisture, the very top surface of it, be a little bit drier so you don't really attract that kind of thing, fungus gnats and stuff like that. I just really like airflow. I definitely I echo that sentiment. I couldn't agree more. I have uh, in my room, I have three oscillating fans in between my canopy and my and my hoods. And I have three different box fans pointed at different angles underneath the canopy. I think you hit it around right the, the head there, Spartan. I think airflow is, it, it's one of the most underrated parts about growing, I think. But uh, I got to get out of here. I got a family thing. I'm, uh, I'm Noah the Girl from Instagram and you guys have a good show. I'll see you guys all next week. Or love, Thank Noah. You. Hey, man. You too, man. I, I have to stay kind of quiet during this conversation because like I don't filter much air at all and I've been there I've been where I put insect screens over the, you know intakes to grows but I'm out here using the insects in my environment <clears throat> to my advantage so 
whole different style and probably not something a lot of home growers do unless they're in their backyard with no hoop house. There's still things you can do, for example, uh, like you can put those bug traps up. Uh, you can put uh, caterpillar traps up. You can put uh, those little, uh, is it a black light or is it for some kind of a weird fluorescent that attracts bugs? And they make all kinds of trap things. Look in the industry like uh, horse, people that have horses, things like that. Caterpillars is, awesome dude, my DMs have been blowing up with people in the Pacific Northwest having caterpillar issues. And they, the problem is that everybody says, I have caterpillars and bud rot. What do I do? Well, you're in flower. It's too late. It's time to pull the bud off, throw that away and pray and, you know, cover I, it with an umbrella. If it rains, do what you got to do, but spray BT during, um, during veg a couple of times and it'll live into flower on the phylosphere. BTK, and, not BTI. Make sure people. That's it right. depends on your. Bacillus. It depends on your species. Yeah, it depends yeah. on your, the species of caterpillar. Bacillus. Well, on a Bacillus thuringiensis crustaki is for, kind of Lepidoptera in general. Um, but, yeah, like and like you were saying, um, the, you. I had to tell somebody a couple of somebody's recently the exact same thing. That um, the, uh, that there was no. Uh, <laughs> it was too late. Sorry, yeah. like they're already there. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but you know, you, you every season you get a little bit better at at figuring this stuff out, and you make moves. It's yeah. like chess; you just make moves earlier and earlier and earlier, and eventually I was you just pick gonna, up a good chess game. Yeah, I was just gonna make that point. I was gonna say, but it's not a total loss because you learn something. Hey, this time of year is when those fucking caterpillars come, so I'm gonna do, a month ahead of time. I'm gonna do something about that, or even before that. Yep. absolutely and that would be the that would be like the second best thing you can do trichogramma what trichogramma right trichoderma trichogramma trichogramma Trichogramma. Wasp. Trichogramma. Trichogramma yeah. wasp the parasitary uh, wasp that's right they, they will murk some caterpillars and moths i know yeah that's definitely true and then also recording just like when you first spot this problem and sort of correlating that and then you know like spartan saying kind of take a healthy amount of time before maybe a month or two to really get into whatever it takes for you to sort of uh materialize all the resources you need to attack that objective um so like mesh screening for example and applying the right biopesticides or biocontrol agents in general it's a bit it's a big important thing to do matthew um, i've mentioned in the past for this type of pest um the tangle foot but i don't know if i've ever actually heard your opinion on that but it's basically an organic like a little sticky substance that you can wrap around the base of the stalk for a lot of crawling and uh, pests like that so if the caterpillars aren't from like trees nearby which spartan always warns people outdoor and in, in greenhouses to try to avoid if you can but if it's not from that an air situation do you think that the tangle foot uh plus like a btk might be effective you mean like BTK an, might be by itself, but Tanglefoot. Like indoor? Any situation, I guess. Like in Aaron's situation, he's a like to have greenhouse. You're thinking the problem is is that you know, you're yeah. thinking the, the egg comes before the chicken, but the chicken has to lay that egg. So it's it's the moth, <laughs> you know, it's it's it's, it's the moth or the flyer well that lays said, the eggs dude. on the plant. It's laying yeah. it on the plant and it's it's hatched right there. So that's the right. It's not gonna help it. Well, it's it's half right. So a lot of caterpillars grow. There's a bunch of different kinds of caterpillars. A lot of them are generalists. Um, a lot of the ones that we're dealing with in cannabis are kind of generalistic, like the tobacco budworm moth. Um, I think there are other helicoverpa uh, species that might also affect cannabis that escape my mind. I just found a fall armyworm, which is all the armyworms are noctuity and they're in the Spidoptera genus. And um, they're a big thing. They're big journalists. And a lot of those larger caterpillars, like the fault, like the army worms, for example, they will move from one plant to another plant. Either they get disturbed and they drop off and then they travel across the ground and then find another plant and go up it. In that way, maybe a tangle foot can be helpful. Um, but Spartan's right. Like the, it's the keeping the oval position from happening in the first place aerially um, that's the really number one objective to take care of because some caterpillars don't have that um, behavior type. A lot of Matthew, them don't. Matthew, I had a follow-up for that then because um, the guy I learned from was Mel Frank, just a simple, like uh, he used two steps, but he never says the full 
thing he says bt so maybe he used btk and bti um we used btk and tanglefoot and that got rid of our caterpillar issues but i guess it was probably the ptk in the situation i don't I never thought that they're flying to it i was like oh it got rid of the problem and so yeah, i don't worry about it anymore the problem's gone but i got um, a buddy who swears by tanglefoot and he he says like almost all of his you know ground-based bugs are prevented but my thing is like i don't know what it what is necessarily me personally i've never used it so i don't know what's in it i don't know if i can have it interacting with my soil microbes and you know stuff like that it's like a boogery like material i guess it's like a, right. a slime and you can wrap it around the stalk like maybe a few inches up from your soil but a few inches down from where your first leaves are so it acts as like basically like a barrier between whatever would try and climb up your stalk and it does yeah, you, catch a bunch you, of junk you'd apply it to like the trunk kind of of the tree but it's for trees yeah. i think what's in originally it? it's it's all organic it's i know that plant i think oh yeah tanglefoot is the plant it comes from that's why it's called oh. tanglefoot so it's it's a natural substance it's clean uh something that you would see in like a clean green certified garden i think I like it for, um, I haven't used it, but I like the idea of it for, for mites, especially things like that, even though they can come in on the air too, but uh, anything that's crawling up the stem, I, I like the idea, but it's kind of on the same flow of thought, we'll say, I'm going to take you into Spartan's organic fucking uh, ponderings, but uh, this is just a crazy thought, even though this isn't really applicable indoor, but it is outdoor. Don't always kill things that you think uh, are detrimental. Um, I made the mistake one time, and I'm going to tell you, and you can learn along with me. Um, I was out in my in picking tomatoes, and I seen a tomato hornworm. And I hate those fucking things, man. They're so fucking gross to me. They, they just creep me out. And they like, I swear they half scream when you kill them. But anyhow, I went and I killed this one, but at first I looked at it, and he had a bunch of like growths on its back. It looked like eggs almost on its back. I'm like, oh my God, this thing is extra disgusting. So, I, you know, I just killed it. You know what I mean? I got the fuck out of there and I killed it. Then I came in, I was curious. I came and looked. Those are parasitic wasp eggs on its back. If I would have left it alive and just like maybe taken a leaf off of it or whatever and got it away from my plant so it couldn't do much danger, I could have helped myself by leaving it alive. So yeah, just make sure you know what the hell you're doing when you do things. <laughs> I'm a huge advocate of that. Um, I'll definitely echo that, you know, hundredfold that people should become familiar with the arthropods that they come across, really any life that you come across. Uh, find out what it is first. Identify first before you kill it. So many people I've had to tell, like, you know, err on the side of caution, understandable. But like, you know, people are like, what's this? Oh, I killed it already just to find out it's a beneficial predator or an, an indication that you might even have a problem or that they're attracted maybe, you know, just like, uh, you know, just the observation itself has a lot of information um, that you can kind of use if you know how and why. It's especially bad when someone gets like nuclear on it when it's a beneficial, like they use something like a nasty treatment, you know, like something that they probably shouldn't have used. And they're like, oh, I got to kill it. I got to kill it. And then they just use, pull out all the stops and turn inside. You're like, oh yeah, that was actually something that'd be good for you. So go with fire, just go with fire. I do like the um, sometimes better safe than sorry approach, but it's good to identify what you're dealing with always and um, know what you're fighting because it makes it a lot easier to deal with, right? And tomato hornworms, they sizzle if you throw them in fire, just let you know. <laughs> you know way too much about killing these things. Dude. I don't like them, man. I don't what like What word them. do they scream while you're chopping them in half? I don't, they, it's just scream. It's like a hissy scream noise. I don't know. But. <laughs> I feel it's bad like, about uh, it. I, I don't. I don't love it, but uh, I feel bad about it. But uh, still, I mean, I'm not gonna let them eat my food. It's well, you know, and that's that's what it all comes down to, right? I mean, that's that's probably why it kind of hisses. Like, fun fact: the caterpillar body requires it to be as big as it is and to eat as much as it does. It's kind of meant to get a lot of caterpillars, anyways, are meant to eat a whole whole lot. That's their big adaptation: is that they grow really fast and that they constantly eat. Um, and they process what they eat really well. And so that all that pressure kind of keeps them stable almost as well. There's a lot of other things. There's like an endoskeleton, but when you rupture that, like it's like a cell, man, like you lies it, everything's coming out. Like, so it's probably... So DK asks in the chat, do parasitic wasps sting? I know that the aureus or the pirate bug basically like stabs or stings like everything. Yeah, but that's not a parasitic. Things, but but uh, a parasitic. what about the parasitic wasps, no. Matthew? 
or Aaron? None of them? Yeah, they do humans. Space. You mean people or what? Yeah, what like a human. I'm, I'm presuming DK is asking for the gardener and the cultivators uh, if they can get stung by their own parasitic wasps. No, I don't think I've ever heard of that. I'm, there might be some species that I'm just not aware of, but I don't think they're I've a lot ever smaller. Heard of than yeah. I expect to when when I hear parasitic wasp I think of like a normal wasp and so um, as like a person coming from like a non uh, entomology perspective you might think oh parasitic wasp I'm going to have basically bees flying around attacking these little things but really they're these tiny little bugs often like really really small and um, it's crazy like if you watch them up close what they do it's really amazing and impressive there's even some cool diagrams of like them I think ovum depositing I'm probably mispronouncing but that process They've documented it really well, and it's fascinating to uh, witness those types of things. Those are the most fun for me to, to apply. I love parasitic wasps. We have only had them once in a while because they're expensive, and uh, but we only use them when we have like an actual issue or something. But uh, I love it, man. I just I just picture them as fighter jets flying through the grow room, dude. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely just say that um, a lot of par- so two things. One. Uh, a parasite doesn't typically kill its host within the matter of its life cycle or like a matter of its like normal functioning, whether, whereas a parasitoid does as like a normal course of its parasitation. And then two, so to that point, some parasitoid wasps, they'll either, they'll host feed, they'll like sting a target and then feed on it um, themselves, like females to get a blood meal so they can make eggs and generate them. Um and or, but in a lot of other cases, uh, parasitoid wasps will simply sting and, and, and ven- envenomate their host, and then they will um, not feed on it or anything like that because the larvae will do that. And a lot of other parasitoid wasps use viruses, um, poly DNA viruses, for example, to sort of suppress the immune system. Um, it's pretty crazy. What's uh, the process with aphidias that makes them basically mummify or put them their uh, victim in a little cocoon type thing? I don't actually know what causes the like body hardening because, but like I've mentioned earlier, like aphids are also kind of, they have an exoskeleton, but they're kind of soft bodied. And so it could be a reaction with the viruses I'm talking about. It, I wouldn't be surprised. It could also be just a function that of how they eat and maybe like something they secrete because they start with like the non, like the less lethal organs first. And, you know, over time that larva grows larger and then it uses the body to pupate. I mean, it makes a pupa itself, it pupates, but it uses the husk for defense, you know? And I saw, I have a video on my YouTube channel of a lacewing larva uh, sort of aggressing uh, a mummy, an aphid that's been parasitized. uh, And then it kind of gives up. (laughs) But like, if it didn't make that husk, um, that, that parasitoid would be dead. So there's probably a happy little adaptive accident that happened. Sounds like chitin, if I had to guess. Well, I mean, it'll, it'll, it has chitin on it already because of the aphid, but that's a good question. Like maybe something, maybe like some hardening effect or um, maybe it makes more matrices of the chitin or something. I want to shout out Chad. First of all, I want to shout out the American one who was able to work past his internet issues, get in here. But, uh, and then somebody was killing me in chat who was at uh, smart poker said, talking about the wasp in the grow room says, I'm going to be, it's going to be hard in my bee suit for fertigation and training. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, you're good. These things look more like flies, man. They're like, even beekeepers don't often wear bee, bee suits. My buddy, my barber, very true. Beekeeper, he doesn't wear a bee suit almost That's ever. True. Very if you don't rarely. fuck with them, they won't fuck with you, you know? Hmm. I have a question um, towards uh, at Zenthanol. So I, would, I, you know, put some plants out in the middle of the woods of nowhere, and I've brought um, praying mantis cocoons and ladybugs, and they both pretty much stuck around. Now, the praying mantises, obviously, most of them went away, but by the end of the season, I had like two giant ones. So I know they're eating something, but my question is, will they eat the moths that make the caterpillars? And how effective would that be with uh, maybe not the ladybugs, but yeah. Is there other um, larger insects that could be beneficial? Yeah, so like, that you that would be commercially available not a whole lot i don't think praying mantises are very good biocontrols for 
a lot of things. Um, they definitely will eat, like would you say, like moths. And I've seen them hang around, like if you have a light fixture or maybe a trap. And then the the mantids will be attracted to the light. And then the so will the moths. And so I see that can be kind of a bloodbath. <laughs> um, but uh, I've seen them eat some grasshoppers too a couple times. The praying mantis in my oh, patch. So they yeah. eat each other. They'll eat their brothers and sisters if you have two they cocoons on the same anything, plant. Anything, dude. Yeah. I was gonna say that's why you. That's why they went away. They didn't go away. <laughs> that's why the other two are big right <laughs> they now. Went, they went away <laughs> into each other. <laughs> they uh, kind of imploded. Uh, you they might say that's broken. why they doubled in size. <laughs> Together we are stronger. <laughs> that, that mass, yeah, that mass went somewhere. Um, uh, but yeah, I would say that from a natural ecological perspective. So this is one reason why I'm a big advocate of sort of trying to attract them or intelligently using sort of an agricultural space or a plot of land. Dragonflies um, are they're my one of my favorite insects, the whole group, because they're such amazing aerial predators. They'll take down tons of things, depending on the species and that sort of a thing. Uh, so dragonflies, if you live near a place where those exist, those can be useful for flies and moths and other, other sorts of things. Um, Question about dragonflies, Matt. Yeah. I heard that they catch virtually everything that they go after, that they, that I don't know if maybe there's never been one observed missing its prey. Is that true? Or what do you know about that? They're really competent and deft flyers. Um, and so when they go after prey, they kind of, they, they take their legs and they kind of weave them like a basket. They kind of like cross their legs. So it's kind of like a, a sort of a catching vehicle. And then they speed up. They oftentimes they use their eyes to like kind of be away, sort of like in the blind spot of, of an approaching target. And then they catch them. So they're really effective in that way. And they're just very strong and very fast flyers. And so it works out. Uh, Another really good aerial predator that's not the same kind of thing. They can miss, though. I guess I'll, I'll make that point. I, I don't think that that's impossible. But robber flies, um, which look really mean, and they look like they would hurt you, um, but they don't. Uh, they'll go after a ton of other things, too, like moths. And they'll go after, like, really small flies, and they'll go after larger, like, moths and honeybees and all kinds of other things. And I'm a big fan of those. Um, as far as like uh, attracting them or generating them, um, that's sort of going to really be a nebulous topic. It'll depend on where you're at. Um, but knowing that they exist, like Spartan said earlier, taking a picture, trying to do some investigative work, going on a forum, looking at an agricultural extension agent, somebody to find out. Me, for example, I love to identify these sorts of things for people. Um, you know, you, you become more enriched and you find out that these things are actually beneficial and maybe you don't freak out so much. Matthew, I sent you a photo of a dragonfly on a cannabis plant this week on Twitter. I don't know if you got that in the DMs or not, but it was beautiful uh, just photography wise. But I know that you like just different images of uh, pests or, or predators on cannabis. And that was a really cool one. Locally near me, there's a hike that I go on where there's sort of a really like algae thick uh, area of this little creek. And there's probably like anywhere between like three and like 10 massive dragonflies every time like I walk past this one area and they're just beautiful and definitely go into town down there in that little area because they're very active and quick and it's kind of amazing to see them in nature. But uh, would they be something you could potentially harvest and bring into your grow room or if you're an outdoor cultivator, encourage them to come to your plants? Sort of, but not. I don't think the easiest way you could do that is by having um a water so some sort of like pond or lake or something um or stream or something you know it depends but uh dragonflies require water to complete their life cycle and um this always triggers the following fun fact i like to say which is that insects kind of developed from the what are called the pan crustacea so they're kind of like crustaceans that um colonize land and for a lot of insects, they didn't stop like having a aquatic or semi-aquatic aspect of their life cycle, mostly in fresh water. So it's definitely doable. You could do Not a, a greenhouse like uh, uh, Potent Pond XD, where you have a ton of water and you're floating the plants on the water. 
and you could totally have dragonflies. Well, they, they're carnivorous. You had to be open water. That's probably they're they carnivorous. Yeah, that too. You'd have, you'd have to have something to feed them. They're super carnivorous. They love. <laughs> they're really good at what they do. Um, I think that it would require a little bit of um, sort of terraforming and landscaping, but. I think that's a really cool idea for ecological restoration efforts and that kind of a thing. And then would it be crazy to just put a bucket in, near your greenhouse and not that would that do it? Bucket of well, water. Well, I think it's well, it's complex, right? Because they're kind of mosquitoes. Kind of well, some some don't really. They eat, eat the mosquitoes, right? Right. Some of them do. Yeah. I think it'd be cool to just do like a pond near your greenhouse. Just freaking have a pond. That'd yeah, cool really. Hell, You'd want them outside anyways, because they're big flyers, and they just they probably um, uh, explode on your fan blades <laughs> at some point. They probably won't. Uh, <laughs> they won't always be perfect all the time. And if you yeah, have a ton as, of them, <laughs> as soon as Jack uh, mentioned, I didn't say anything, but as soon as Jack mentioned <laughs> asking you about the indoors, I thought, yeah, that'd be really good on the fucking filter of your dehumidifier, because that's where you can <laughs> find them at. <laughs> It's gonna look like your windshield after a 500 mile road trip just yeah <laughs> but uh i do like the idea of like kind of merging that having that that shepherding of the landscape plus cultivate like reaping sort of a cultivation benefit from that but you would I've also actually want done to control... that oh yeah no, i'm sorry i didn't want to jump i was i've actually done that in my just in a small way in my yard outside uh, near my raised beds i planted uh Coneflower, there's another name for them, but coneflower is the common name for them. And I've gotten so many more, not only pollinators, but uh, hold on, I learned this word just today from you, parasitoid wasps. Parasitoid wasps, yeah. Parasitoid wasps. I've seen those, the little guys. And um, so I was super stoked by planting one plant. Now that plant took two years to bloom for whatever reason, but uh, I'm super stoked that it was blooming and I was getting all kinds of insect activity. It looked like beneficial stuff, bees, all different kinds of pollinators. It was cool. And they're I'm tall. Big, like, I'm a big wasp. Yeah. Fan. I think I accidentally did a little uh, landscape job that attracted a beneficial bug. And uh, in one of my grows, I, you know, I dug out the native soil, put in good soil. And there was like a little, you know, pocket of that dirt. It was actually like sand where I live. And I come, I come there one day and I see this wasp digging a hole. And the damn thing dug a hole in the sand and then dragged the caterpillar into the hole and then buried it. So I, when I got home, I eventually figured out what it was. Some, I, I don't know, I'd have to look it up again, but I'm sure uh, uh, Matthew would probably know what it was. But he took a caterpillar in there, so I know it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely some sort of um, a parasitoid wasp. There's a lot, a lot of like mud daubers and um, uh, what do we call it? Like not social, but... Um, uh, solitary wasps they'll go after spiders they'll go after caterpillars um you know they love to carve up those like food tubes of like fat and protein which is great whether you're an, whether you're a social or a um or a solitary wasp you want to give that to your larvae so they can bulk up and then pupate and then you're gonna you you might eat proteins and that sort of things too depending on what you are what species but at that point, a lot of sugary materials are going to be really great for the high energy um, sort of uh, muscle movement for the wings and that kind of a thing. Uh, so yeah, social wasps like Polistas, paper, what are called paper wasps, um, they're really docile. And if you can stomach them being around you and you're not allergic or anything like that, um, you know, leave them alone. They'll take care of your caterpillars. I wanted to jump back to something Spartan said earlier that his, uh, I think he said the hookworm or hornworm, they sort of screamed when you burned it. And what Matthew was talking about with like the crustacea period insects basically transitioning to land. I think as a former lobster diver and somebody who's just seen lobster boiled enough, when you cook it that way, they actually kind of have a scream. And some people theorize it's like just oxygen or something off gassing when they're boiling, but they definitely let off some sort of screaming. It sounds like a teapot almost that's, uh, that's what it is when i scream too when i'm being murdered it's just an off gas out of my lungs that's true though <laughs> pass it's passing through some uh, cordage but no it's it's definitely like a physical reaction to the like i think de i think it's like decompression right but 
But it's interesting that that pest, because we talked about like how even uh, Dr. MJ in the past has talked about certain uh, bugs will taste like lobster, or essentially, you know, lobsters are just, they call them bugs here in San Diego. Like you say you're going bugging, looking for uh, lobsters. Here, they don't have claws. They're just like a spiny lobster. So it's not the one that you're, like the main lobsters. Yeah, imagine, um, I mean, imagine all the like land lobsters we missed out on that could have been around nowadays, like. I don't know. You don't even have to go to the ocean to get them. Yeah, if those things crawled around on land, I don't think you could get people to eat them as easily as you could since they live under the water. You might be yeah, right. I don't. I don't eat them anyway. <laughs> the I mean, we're so funny about food. That is true too. I, I I'll tell you what. Like, although I'm a advocate of entomophagy, um, I probably would not want to try ever like tarantula. Or like spiders, because I've seen them. I've seen them cook them, and no thanks. But uh, beetle yeah, larvae. Yeah. Or how about like you know some of those varieties of cockroach? Uh, yeah, not so much. But the beetle larvae, maybe if it was the beetle like... larva. Yeah, and the the chapulines, which are really, I think, yeah, um, a, a different thing than eating a cockroach. Dude, I, if you I... put enough chocolate on it, you can eat anything. I saw an ad. I Being saw, grasshoppers I, and ants. Oh, that's not a good way to sustain yourself for like caloric <laughs> needs. Like, I ate a cricket. It's this much chocolate. This... Arsenic with uh, chocolate, right. you know, goes down nice and easy. Yeah. I follow. I follow a few entomophagy um, accounts on Instagram and Twitter and other places, and I saw an advertisement. I can't remember who it was, but they were like saying that formic acid. I think it's what they said because it's formicity is the ants, right? So formic acid is um, what, ca- what causes them to be like the most tangiest or saltiest or I forget, maybe, I forget exactly what taste they ascribed it to, but they're like, they're the most tangiest uh, animal because of the formic acid. And in my mind, I'm thinking like, nope, that's not, that's <laughs> not uh gonna convince people i don't think not a selling point for you no (laughs) what about the uh the ants that are named after being smelly what are they called um oh yeah odorous like odorous 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 ants dude i I were talking about me eating in my cereal i think dude i get those they you squish them you smell your hand and it smells like like poison yeah it smells like nasty i and they got into my cereal man and i ate a bunch of them i was like what is this damn taste it was that's terrible it was the grossest thing ever oh that's how it happens that's how i I ate a bunch of ants in my cereal and they were fucking great they're little sugar ants though they they taste that's what i just had a cookie they got into my i had a cookie sitting out and like it was out for a while i was eating like uh i ate some fast food i got that wendy's four for four and got a little cookie with it my cookie's sitting over there and i didn't realize it but there's this ants this time of year in California and it was dark. I fucking ate that cookie right down. And as I look at like the rape wrapper, they're crawling through all the crumbs. So I can't imagine that I didn't eat a bunch of them, but like Spartan you said, I didn't even know this. No. The odiferous ants, man. It, they have a very, very strong, peculiar taste. And now Aaron, when I smell them like that, my fingers, it just brings that flavor back to my whole. Oh, you know, I can't imagine. I, I, feel for you what a it's terrible a very, terps, man it's that was a very terps. distinct and and memorable and awful man i wish i could i wish i I lived by you man because uh i would love to like ambush you at work or something and squish my oh, <laughs> just no. ambush you like, I, <laughs> like i'm chloroforming you or something <laughs> no. uh, have some pent-up hostilities I mean, towards me there Spartan. There, i don't know man What's amazing. Amazing. i just think it's funny i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> I gotta love the chat. They say dank ants and then ant terps. Shout out to Grow Talented and DK. That was funny. You guys made me laugh. I appreciate it. Also, Shredder0911, I'm gonna answer your question or this supposition about yabbies might not being good for aquaponics. Um, when you should check out the potent ponics episode we did, uh, because I experimented, I I shared that I experimented with using inverts, um, particularly uh ram's horn snails which i didn't eat anything from because they're snails and they can be vectors for bad stuff but also crayfish and uh potent ponics mentioned that uh invertebrates aren't very good because the nutrients that you want normally in the water if i remember correctly they're typically just not there in the amounts that you want or they're too much and they're toxic so 
you know, you got to be careful about that. That was a great episode. He just did a Michigan Bros Grow Show episode, and he's got 200 plus of his own. So wealth of knowledge. Love Steve, uh, Potent Ponic Steve. He's a great dude. And uh, Growing with the Fishes is his podcast. But yeah, he's a great guy. And that episode we did, I really enjoyed him coming on. He's super helpful. If you guys have questions about aquaponics you're interested in, it, just fucking send him a DM and he'll get back with you. Yeah, he's really great about that. I really like working with the guy. And I'll be talking, I guess I should plug now, um, the his first inaugural um, aquaponics cannabis. Oh, man, I'm forgetting the title. It's it comes like, up in the, a few weeks, October yeah. 3rd and 4th, right? In October, yeah. We'll be talking about, uh, can, I'll be talking about cannabis IPM in an aquaponics context. So if you're interested in that, and a bunch of other aquapon- cannabis aquaponic stuff, please take a look at him on Instagram and also YouTube, right? Definitely. Am I wrong? Potent Ponics on Instagram. Yeah, not only on Instagram. Okay. They're on YouTube as well. That's where uh, they do their live stream. Yeah, that's what I wanted to. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. So please check him out. Great guy. The title of that particular thing that Matthew will be uh, presenting at is the Virtual Aquaponics Cannabis Conference, October 3rd and 4th, and it starts at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So that's uh, 11. Oh, there you go. Spartan's showing it. I've got it up over here, too, but he's doing a much better job capturing it on his <laughs> webcam over there. Say something, Spartan, so that we can see it. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll spotlight him. Actually, you know what? I can't do it because Aaron the Grower, you are the... Um, hosts, I think. I spotlighted him on my side, go. but I don't go. know if it will do it for the YouTube. We'll see. Nice. That's no, it. dude, I transferred the host back to you. You should be the. Oh, okay, cool, host. cool, cool. Yeah, it did yeah. actually pop it up. Perfect. Sorry, I stepped away from. It. It's super trippy because on the screen it's all in reverse. It looks like. I can, I can see read it. it on Zoom. Let's That's see if great. I can see it on YouTube. Oh, it's it's per- it's cool. We can see it. Yeah, it looks right. All right, cool. Just just me. Nice. All right, All right we got that. I'm fucking tired now. I'm putting it down. <laughs> yeah, you can put it down. We made you do enough work. You've got a, a few more minutes until we'll uh, let you sign out and go hang with the dogs and get some water and use the bathroom, et cetera, before your next show. But uh, I guess what topics do you guys want to get into for our last uh, 10 or 15 minutes before we do our sign outs? Hmm. I'd say what I'd say what y'all smoking on, but I I'm the only one I see smoke in the air. I don't know, man. <laughs> That's a good topic. I got lime Kush. I'm about to pack one up. I've been uh, hosting. Papa Greenstock actually called me. That's why I was away from the keyboard for a little bit there. I was uh, catching up with my father. So always I heard that to Spartan. Talk I've been I've been I've been keeping up with you, bro. I've been I've been uh, I, a woman you. I, I, I did, but you were gone at that point. So sorry, I didn't give up. I was still in the game. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I've been dabbing over on the right. I've been smoking bowls on the left. I've hit every piece. I've hit every piece I own except for the <laughs> stuff that I refuse to smoke out of that were gifts. But everything else, I've hit everything. What are you smoking <laughs> on? The blueberry, uh, what was it? Blueberry Quintessa from, I don't remember. Was it Coma? It might be Coma. I can't remember. Uh, but it was a uh, DJ Short Blueberry sativa not the indica crossed with uh quintessa which was a the quintessa i can't even speak quintessa was a one-to-one thc cbd so i don't know if this would technically be a two-to-one or it's basically a higher thc with a little bit of cbd but i really like it and enjoy it shout out to coma eagle gardens who uh aaron the grower is going to be on fucking talking shit with the eagle later this week um, he sent me some seeds. They're tangy, crossed with jelly bean, crossed to that blueberry sativa IBL from Coma Creations as well. And that's where I got the seeds from this plant, was from Eagle Garden. Shout out to you, Eagle, if you're listening. He's the man. I should definitely go into that podcast pretty soon now. It's cool. It's a cool podcast. It's like a one-on-one, and you just uh, talk about your life. And, and, yeah, it was and what led you led you to where you're at now? That, that's the general outline of the show. It's just a hangout. It's cool. I enjoyed it a lot going on with the Eagle. Um, I decided to go back in and try to dig through my vault a little bit. I got a bunch of stuff from like grows gone by. So I've been sampling things from like last year and even the year before that. I got uh, some Colorado cookies from the 
2019 spring auto flower challenge in my pipe right now. I need to get a new vaporizer. I like the the paranormal series for atomizers. Oh, vaporizers like the volcano. Yeah, exactly. I think I'm gonna get a volcano. I have the a smaller stores and bickle. Um but yeah, I want something that plugs into the wall. The smaller one, is that called the mighty? I have the they mighty have the that's crafty. the handheld. I have the baby. The crafty you can pair with your phone. The mighty is um like the bigger crafty. It has the digital numbers on the actual handheld, but they also have one that looks like a kind of like a gun with like the spiral kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it maybe the plenty or something. But um yeah, there's Stores and Bickle makes great vaporizers. They've been around for a while. They're most known for their volcano, and uh, which I like to see they just put out a volcano with the whip. I'm a fan yeah. of the whip because the bag, the noise, and I have cats. The cast, pop it. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, man. Whip, and you get the better flavor in the whip. It gets stagnant in that bag unless you take it all in one puff, which is kind of defeats the purpose. You want to fill it up and take a few puffs off it, right? It gets stagnant in the bag. Or on the whip, you're getting a fresh puff every time. Stir it up. Get fresh greens on the top. It just, uh, in my opinion, is a little bit better system personally. And uh, what's volcano. The SMB. Well, what's that? I forget what it stands for. What's that stand for? The company. Stores and Bickle. All right, Stores and Bickle. If you want to sponsor a guy, you hook me up. I'll fucking suck on that fucking whip all podcast. <laughs> if you want a cheaper with one. That, the prospects just went to zero. <laughs> Vapor Brothers. I want to shout them out. They're the original desktop vapor riser. It looks like a pencil box almost, but um, it's just a little basically wooden box there's a ceramic heating element and then you click it on with a little uh dial and it has a whip and has probably That's the best OG flavor shit man that goes way back those vaporizers are like the original and then it was like volcano and volcano just been running it since yeah they've been killing it i really like the um that one because it has like a really trippy blue light and underneath it's like a green light they're silent like so i could be hitting it at midnight and there's no crinkling bag for like my neighbors or my uh, family members are sleeping and no cats to fuck with it, um, but it's a lot cheaper. I think that was like only 150 bucks versus the Volcano Whip is like five or 600 bucks. So I wanted to throw that out there for the people that are like, fuck combustion, only vaporization. Um, I do both. You see me hitting my bongo over here too, but uh, I like vape for the flavor and a little bit different uh, experience of uh, the high. Yeah, we need, to get, we need to get DK up on here. He says he has every S&B device ever made. And he says uh, he doesn't use the SMB because the sublimator hits 10 times harder. Is that a different company? Sublimator? I remember sublimator. Yeah. Dude, what happened to those guys? They're still Are around. They still doing it's expensive. Stuff? It's like a metal thing that you can put under your bowl. It like heats up a thing and you stick it on top of the bowl. And it, I don't know. They talk about it. Like Dude, just every time I look at that thing, I'm like, what? How, how do you, you take 45 minutes and then you get a hit? Cool. I, uh, you can burn yourself on it. That's the thing I, I don't really like. You have to get like the cage or otherwise you can bump into it. Like the one that I was just showing with the Vapor Brothers, the heating element is sunken into the box. So the whip, you kind of like press down into it. So you're not going to accidentally walk past it and burn yourself. Or with the sublimator, I think that's something uh, if you're a clumsy stoner, you might bump into because it's sitting on the side of your bong. It's kind of like a nail though. I guess you don't, unless you burn yourself on your nail a bunch, which people do. <laughs> I know a lot of people with dab like scars, permanent. Mine were only temporary, but touching that hot nail, man, it sucks. I mean, I respect a, a hit that's 10 times harder, though, but whatever. <laughs> and they so really missed out on the, on the dab scar propaganda. <laughs> this, is, this is embarrassing, but I'm going to share it anyway. Um, that's one of the reasons I don't have a rig right now is because the first time, well, it wasn't the first, the first day that I hit a rig like that, um, it wasn't the very first time because somebody was there coaching me, but then I went back and then went back, went back. Well, in that process, you know, whatever trip it was, I went back and it's just learned response from doing it a hundred million times before. Like when you take a bong rip and you pull the fucking bowl to, to empty the chamber, I fucking did that. Burnt the shit out of my fingers. So, no. so yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I played it off there time. too. I, I, I hit it and it was like, Oh shit. And I put it right back down real quick. I, but I just the rest of the day I went and I, I went and got a pop out of the fucking cooler that was really cold and I held my fingers on it and I was all trying to be cool and not say anything. But it's not fun, man. It's just like it's weird. It's just like you do the same thing over and over, yeah. day in day out, and it's hard to break habits. I so it, it, that's what I loved habits. about the little handheld crafty vape that it just like you put it in, you push a button. There's nothing hot that you're ever touching or messing with, and it. 
Do you guys yeah. remember the video of that girl who was like really dabbed out on her live and she hit her dab backwards. So she put her, the hot nail right up to her lips on her live. Do you remember that? Terrible. I didn't see that. Oh my God. I don't know. This if I is, a, this is years ago. I'm talking like when live first hit Instagram, whenever that was. It may not have been a live. Actually, it may have been before that. I don't know. Maybe somebody in the chat knows. Did she scream bloody murder after that? I don't know. I never saw the video. There's just a thousand memes made after it. The video is gone, but like all these memes, somebody snapshot it, you know, screenshotted her. Doing, mm. be somewhere. Uh, this is but, called a ghost MV1 vaporizer because I can't find my mighty right now, but it's a pretty solid one. It cools down the air a lot before it gets to you. So it's supposed to be like the best flavor of a handheld. I saw a guy who reviewed like 40 different handhelds and he's like, this is my favorite one. So I got it. I don't use it enough. So I'm going to gift it to my brother. <laughs> He needs it more than I do. He's got a kid on the way. Or actually, new new baby just born, so it's much more uh, sensible for him to have it. Vaporizing is a lot less uh, stinky than using uh, smoke or something like that. Congratulations, yeah. Uncle Jack. Uncle Jack, yeah. And I'm yeah, going to be great, a, an uh, uncle again to my other brother who's having a, another baby girl. So two new baby girls added to the Greenstock family. Two new branches. Uh, Jack, KennyBis03 asked in chat, what strain can I pick up that has those grape terps that you talk about? Well, I'll be a little bit um, like you in this. Sometimes I'll be I'll be very specific and say grape is actually very often not a terpene. I would argue that it's almost never a terpene. Grape is brought by uh, ester that's called methylanthranolate, at least in my experience. Um, what I know as the smell of grape and consider that grape smell um, that kind of like artificial grapiness that I've found in a lot of different cannabis from purple punch to, um, grape pie, um, granddaddy purple. A lot of those strains bring that grape flavor. It's coming from that ester methyl anthranolate, not a terpene. I've looked long and hard for terpenes that smell like grapes. And I've looked into actual grapes to see which terpenes they have. Some of them have limonene, um, but limonene doesn't. You ever really looked at Delato? Have you ever looked at Delato? I've smoked it. We've grown, we grew a pheno of Delato where we had 150 plants in that room. And when you opened that door, it smelled like you were walking in a winery. It smelled like fresh crushed grapes. It was beautiful. And did you happen to have any terpene testing done on that particular plant? No, no. And we're, I don't think, or no, we do. I think we still, I think we still do have a mom of it going. So we might still have the, the plant. I would say you might be let down like some of the people that since I posted the story, I've had it made a saved story on my thing that says like grape smell rabbit hole. A bunch of people reached out to me and they're like, oh, my purple punch cut smells amazing, but the terpene tests always come back really low. And what I think that is, is it's committing more of its secondary metabolites to esters, which aren't going to show up on a terpene test. What so it might ester? smell loud. Ester is like an alcohol. Um, it's okay. produced by the cannabis plant. So it's like a, sh like a sugar derivative, like... It's an acid derivative. Okay. There's also aldehydes are another one that have popped up in my smell uh, quest. I thought, like many others, that cannabis smell comes from terpenes. Like a lot of articles and videos will tell you. And many of the smells do come from terpenes. That is correct. But esters, aldehydes, uh, ketones, there's a whole bunch of different things that play roles into how a plant smells. You ever had a grain alcohol that <clears throat> every, I don't know, when I was like in my twenties, we used to get grain alcohol. It's always grape flavored. And it made me, it makes me wonder about, it connects some dots in my head. I wonder if that has anything to do with that being like a convenient ether to use is a grape based ether. Probably distilled from a grape husk or something like that. Sure. Like a bunch yeah. of waste product from the wine industry. I'm sure they could figure out how to mm -hmm. ferment it and make a higher concentration, higher proof alcohols that would taste yeah. like grapes. Using, um, uh, it's not must, it's called pumice. I think it's called pumice, the waste from, uh, from like the musting process and like all the, the, the skins and the, the sort of refuse. Um, trying to turn that into something that's useful has been a really big sort of um, point of order for um, streamlining those processes. But I imagine that, like Aaron's saying, there is sort of a convenient, like grape flavoring that they can get. Probably the same stuff they use for candies and all, honestly. I, I, I wouldn't expect it Methyl to be. again, it's what they use for bird repellent too. Uh, it's pretty cheap. You can buy it in like big old gallon jugs. Um, but I wanted to say Kevin Jodry 
um, mentioned that some of the best cannabis that he tasted at the Emerald Cup, the one similarity was they all used a grape compost. And that brought out some like subtle flavor that shined underneath all, no matter what strain it was. He said all the ones that he wrote a note on, he went and talked to the cultivators and asked them what they used. And the one same commonality across all of it was they used the same grape compost. And with that said, I wanted to pass it over to Spartan Grown because I know you've got about only 10 minutes left until the Michigan Bros Grow Show. So I want to give you a chance to hop off and uh, get out of here and give yourself time between show. Yeah, that, <clears throat> thanks, Jack. Um, thanks, everybody on the panel. I love hanging with you guys. Like I probably say that every week. Um, shout out to the Michigan Bros Grow Show. Uh, I did, uh, I'll give a little tease. I did, I was over at uh, Abolish Farms House today and we shot an, an inaugural episode of a new show that we'll be launching on there. I don't remember what the hell we called it, but we're just reviewing we're reviewing different uh, strains that we get. And uh, the first one that's going to be on the first episode is the Anvil from Mandalorian Genetic that uh, Sequence grew in the greenhouse. So it's Sun Grown Autoflower is the first one on the episode. So I don't know. It's probably gonna, I don't know when that's going to come out, but I'll let you guys know. And uh, I look forward to it. I'm a big strain history fan and, and just fan of trying a bunch of different ones and seeing their effects and their colors, smells, flavors, all that stuff. So thank you guys for doing that show. And I look forward to it whenever it comes out. And, do you want to get and we made a point that we're not putting like ratings on it. We're not rating the weed. We're just telling you what our impressions are of it. And that's it. Like, hey, you know, when you have a grower and you, you, you're proud of something, you hand it to somebody, you say, tell me what you think. That's what we're doing. It's that kind of show. I think that's a lot more useful, honestly. Yeah, okay. I think so too. Especially it's going to help people in Michigan because the biggest, <laughs> I'm wasting my time here, but I think the biggest issue for us in our industry right now is an uninformed consumer base. So that's how I'm trying to tackle it. I'm trying to say, okay, we're going to get product from dispensaries. We're going to get product from friends. And uh, we're just going to try a bunch of strains and tell them what we think. And uh, maybe people through us can decide a path for them to take so they can not have to spend a ton of money just shooting, you know, in the dark, give them some kind of a target to aim for. And maybe put a new strain on their map that they may have never heard of or thought about before. Yeah. So. And educate different things like, uh, I don't want to give away the whole show, but like for one thing, we went through the dry hit that I, that I think is a dying art um, to, to get your, your flavor. And then we'll get into it in the show. I don't want to give everything away, but we're just throwing stuff like that and, and just try to educate people on, on just some things on smoking. Some people it's all brand new and they don't know how to do anything. So it's one of those, but uh, shout out to chat. Um, you know, that's why we're all doing this. So awesome chat. And uh I'll see you guys next week, man. I'm rambling because I smoked way too much this episode, I guess. But I got two more hours to go. I'll keep smoking. Have a good one, Spartan. <laughs> see you guys. Growers love. Peace, dude. Thank you so much for joining us. We always appreciate Spartan Growing's time. I know he's a busy man uh, over at Mitten Canico, doing it big, big things over there at that facility. Shout out to uh, Michigan Matt, the uh, guy who runs things over there. But they have a small but awesome crew. And uh, I want to throw it over to Aaron because uh, I know you've been quiet for a little bit. Or actually, no, Kyle, you've been silent. Silent, I, I almost missed you because you're just a, a square over there. So, Kyle, do you have any final thoughts before we get our sign-outs in? Yeah, I was just uh, I was just listening to you guys. You know, some areas uh, I don't have too much research in, so it's nice to kind of just listen in. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to look at anything I'm doing, uh, Please feel free to check out Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and for some reason I'm on Social Club uh, at Predicated Breeding. Uh, if anybody's looking for seeds, the letter P, breeding.com. Uh, for anyone that has been there in the past, like whoever's been following us for that long, I do have a PayPal option on there to make it a lot more convenient. I'm still trying to uh, deal with specific vendors that use credit cards, and that's just like a whole thing in itself. But uh, yeah, thanks for everything, you guys. I uh, hope to see you guys next Sunday, and I hope I hope the well for all of you. Thank you so much for joining us, Kyle. I want to give a tip for anyone in the chat or anyone in this industry who uses PayPal. Don't write any notes that would indicate that there is anything cannabis related. Do all of your notes and business through email and something separate from PayPal. If PayPal does get the indication that you are a cannabis business or even a related to cannabis business like uh, Dude Grow Show, I talk about them often. They got their account locked up for six months because they're a cannabis grow show. and They were getting donations from fans. They weren't selling any cannabis products. They do give away seeds, but um, PayPal is one of those not so cannabis friendly payment platforms. So kind of got to keep it on the hush, hush. Don't send any messages saying this is for cannabis seeds or something like that. Just say thanks, um, or nothing, no message at all. So just a quick tip for that because I've seen it 
unfortunately um, bring down businesses payment options for a little while and just inconvenience people. So Aaron the grower, I'm gonna pass it to you next because we've got a small panel remaining tonight. Or just say, oh, thanks for the couch. <laughs> thanks for the pizza, you know. Um, anyway, so yeah, I'm Aaron the grower, uh, ATG Acres on Instagram. Uh, had an episode drop of the homegrown helpers that everybody should check out has a little dose of my life. And then, um, I got something going on with Eagle on Thursday night. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, shit. I was going to say something else, but I can't remember. I too have smoked myself into a coma. Um, uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody. I had a lot of fun tonight. I feel like, uh, you know, we're, I'm starting to loosen up a little bit more on the on the panel, so I feel like uh, you know we're all becoming better friends. I hope, and that's a good sign. So I have fun with you guys. Thank you. I'm glad you feel more comfortable. I think we all sort of build rapport over time and get better at like uh, knowing when someone's done talking and, and muting and not talking over one another. But I think for the most part, we're all um, you know accepting of each other's methods and, and styles, and we all have our differences. But at the end of the day, we're all here for the cannabis plant that really unites us all. So we shouldn't divide each other into these little sub communities we should just be the cannabis growing community whether you're a home grower commercial grower like just be a good person you know and, and push that forward and try and build that community instead of ripping it apart some people tend to do that sometimes so i think it's there's plenty of room for all of us so just uh, spread that love keep sharing knowledge and spreading positivity who and another person that does a bunch of that is dr mj coco who was recently on uh, fucking talking shit with Eagle. I loved that episode and I've liked all of the panel members who've gone there. It's a long form, so get to know a lot about them. Doctor. Hey, yeah, thanks. I love that, that lead in, Jack. Thank you very much. Um, always a pleasure to come on and share some knowledge with all of you guys and listen to all the, the cool insights and, and things you have to, to teach everybody about as well. Um, like, like we often say, I think we all learn stuff from, from participating in this show. Um, as my shout out, I'll invite everybody to come over to my YouTube channel, um, Dr. MJ Coco on YouTube. Uh, I got a bunch of grow light tests, my grow light physics video, and I have several sort of pending tests um, in the hopper right now. I'm doing the, the new Vipar Spectra XS1500, the new Mars FC3000. I got the new Migro Array. And I'm in talks with a really exciting company here out of Southern California that I might go and test all of their lights. So I'll let you know about that maybe next week. Um, but check out that stuff. Come over to Cocoa for Cannabis and visit us and grow our love to the, the panel, to everybody in the chat and everybody else that's listening along. Um, see you next week. Thanks again, Doc. And like I said, I really am going to try and sign up for that uh, plant training grow challenge this time around. And I really look forward to the micro array testing because I think that's going to be a killer light at a very fair price. I was shocked when yeah. I saw how affordable. No, and, uh, it's going to come great. in at a great price. The Micro Array, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I have one um, out hanging up in my testing rig right now. Um, it's a good fixture. I also like that there's a tiered options. So you can get sort of lower price diodes, like mid price diodes and the highest price diodes. And there's not a huge price difference, but at least the offer is... A more affordable option for the people that are getting that entry level uh, light that want to get into leds so shout out to him i want to shout out timber grow lights who i'm currently growing with and hlg love their leds um, timber is actually switching from cob to uh, bar style here in a little bit but i still rock their cobs with uh, some printed circuit boards that i've diy'd on there and um, i want to give matthew gates a chance to give his final sign outs here before we come to our close Thank you, Jack. I really did enjoy having um, a structured topic, although the original topic was water, and we talked about a lot of other cool things in great depth, so I really appreciated the opportunity. I don't know if we should like put like other topics that we talked about that were major in the title, or if that's too much work, but that's an idea. Anyways, for those who are interested in IPM, Integrated Pest Management Information, my name is Matthew Gates. I'm an IPM specialist and I have a YouTube channel called Zenthanol. It's the same one I was talking about, <laughs> talking with in the account or in the chat. So follow me there. You can also find me and my musings on Twitter as well as at Sync Angel on Instagram. Thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate your time and your knowledge and expertise in your field and uh, always, you know, sharing great information. So I wanted to um, ask maybe the people that are here other than I know we went into air filtration and um, IPM. 
are there any other things that you think we should add to the title before I um, close it out? I guess that'll be a good enough title for today because I think those were the other two main topics that we touched on um, for the remainder of the time. But with that being said, I am filling in this week again, like I said, for Shane, who popped in about an hour into the show. So shout out to Shane from Cheap Home Grow. Make sure you follow him there. Check out his website, cheaphomegrow.com. There's a back catalog with a lot of information from his previous shows. This is Growing With My Fellow Growers, which is just one of the shows on the network. I'm Jack Greenstock, the host. You can find me on Instagram as well as Cannabuzz. I'm Jack underscore Greenstock on Twitter. And I also do the podcast Greenstock Talks. And I've got a few books planned for the future, but I'll uh, save that for now. So thank you all for coming. Really appreciate the people that made it for the live chat. Awesome to see so many people here in the YouTube. I'm going to go over and just get an idea. We got 50 thumbs up already. There's 69 watching. So I'm going to make sure to leave a thumbs up myself. 51 there. Cool. Shout out to all 69 of you who are, who are here now. I know that there was probably uh, some more during the show that already left during the signouts, but really appreciate you. Uh, like everybody else has said, we do this show for the listeners as, as much as we do for ourselves. It's a lot of fun to learn along together with everyone. So thanks so much for coming. Uh, appreciate you all. Jack Greenstock signing out. Grow love.